show sponsors the Pest and Predators podcast, Corteva and List E3, and Out of My Canada. By listening to you and remaining unapologetically crop protection, we leverage the world's largest library of actives to provide innovative solutions to your greatest challenges. Tell your Adama sales rep what you're looking for today. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to The Agronomist. I am your host, Lindsay Smith, joining you, but my voice decided not to show up. So uh, I am in sunny Saskatoon with laryngitis, apparently, and uh, just our tonight's guests, if you can believe it, are just up the road at a conference. And just before I bring them in, I want to say hi to everybody in the chat. I'm probably going to be leaning on you a lot for asking questions because uh, I don't think this voice has an hour in it. All right. Uh, yes, Warren, my voice has left the chat, uh, but great to see everybody. Uh, Kevin, I'm glad you got some rain and I'm glad that it's stopping for those of you who still have that harvest to get done. Uh, as always, if you collect those CEU credits, head to realagriculture.com slash agronomist tomorrow and let us know you watch the episode and get those CEU credits. Tonight is all about insects and when I decided to do this show and I asked these gentlemen to be on this show, I actually had no idea they'd be in the same place at the same conference, so let's bring him in. We've got James Tanzi with Sask Egg, and we've got Tyler West with AFC. And uh, James, what conference are the two of you at just up the road? We are at the joint annual meeting of the uh, Entomological Society of Canada and the Entomological Society of Saskatchewan. Uh, so we've got a group of about 180 entomologists from across the country uh, meeting and greeting and talking about all things bug. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, Tyler, are there insects on the menu? Well, there's no insects on the menu tonight, but it did bring my little buddy, the maple yeah, bug. Yeah, <laughs> the maple bug, there. a box elder bug. There it is. Or the box elder bug, also that, yeah. So there we go. They're actually crawling all over the hotel right now. Not a problem yeah. unless you're mm -hmm. going maple. And, unless you are. Yeah, they do. Well, okay, but we are in Saskatoon. It's beautiful. Um, I also call those good weather mm -hmm. bugs because in the fall – warm sunny days you see them you know climbing on the side of buildings whatever so sure. um warren says that will either be a very dry conference or a wild party i'm leaning towards the party <laughs> side Warren yeah. yes um okay so tonight we are going to talk about prairie pe pest problems with which warren wants to know where a prairie problem ends and regular problems begin i'm going to guess about i don't know sudbury um anyway but we do want to tackle uh, what were some of the largest uh, issues this year? We've got a whole bunch to talk about. Um, and some of them are going to cross borders for sure, but we'll focus on what was the biggest issue in, in Saskatchewan this year. James, I'll start with you. Um, with it being so dry, we did hear a lot of reports of grasshoppers, some really high levels, and that was what was predicted. So did all of our nightmares come true on the grasshopper front? Yes, yes, and no. well, yes and no. It could have been worse, uh, to be honest. I mean, we actually had states of emergency declared in a number of different RMs, twenty plus RMs, uh, in Saskatchewan. So the yeah, the problem that was due in part to drought conditions and uh, and in part to uh, to grasshopper pressures, but they were up early. They were up uh, almost a month early in the case of two stripe grasshopper in the southwest. And uh, once they got to be about second instar nymphs, they started to get a little bit mobile and they were getting into seedling crops. Uh, so they were munching on seedling canola, they were munching on seedling cereals, even seedling peas uh, and causing, uh, causing a fair bit of damage. And it's very unusual to see them come up that early, but of course we have the heat and they are exotherms. So, you know, it, it, you know it, everything about them is temperature dependent, but uh, really unusual to see sprays go down when they're that young. Okay, so hang on, Tyler. Why did they show up so early? Let's yeah. Let's deal with that question. Let's deal with that question. That's Tyler, you're reading my mind. That's very scary. So, <laughs> yes, why did they show up so early? City. It's all about the heat. Uh, yeah, it's all it's all about degree day accumulation. So uh, I mentioned before they are ectotherms, so everything about their physiology and a lot of aspects of the beha their behavior are dictated by temperature, and they really like it warm. So these animals will actually, you know, in, when we're talking about two-stripe and lesser migratory, they'll actually bask and get their internal temperatures up into the high 30s, low 40s. And that's when, that's when they run the bass day. Um, so when you get these really warm conditions, they're going to speed through their development really quickly. So they overwinter as eggs. 
and they get to a certain stage of their development. And the stage that they get to of their development is determined by last year's conditions. And of course, we had really warm conditions last year. And so they, they got pretty far advanced as embryos inside those eggs. We got a warm spring and that development continues and they didn't have that far to go, frankly. So they, you know, they finished their development, their, their, their nymphal development or their, their embryonic development and, and, uh, and hatched up as nymphs. And uh, because of the warm temperature, both last year and this year, uh, we saw them come up very early. Yeah, they went to bed. They went to bed older than they typically do. Mm. Is that a good summation? Yeah. There you go. And then they rush through that development in the spring because of the heat. Mm. Yeah, because yeah. they just don't have that far, le far left to go. So, okay. Yeah, so if, you, if, they, if they don't, uh, sorry, if they don't get that far, uh, that can actually really contribute to their to their mortality over winter. Mm -hmm. uh, so they need to get to a certain point in their development as as embryos to survive the winter uh, in big numbers. And of course, you know, of course, we had a lot of heat last uh, last year and and this year, frankly. So you know, they, they so, really sped through their development. Yeah. So two things. One, here I am, uh, middle of October in Saskatoon, and it's quite beautiful. Mm -hmm. So does that, mm -hmm. Tyler? Does that maybe not bode well for pressure for next year? Well, we're seeing the same kind of conditions as we did last October. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, Jim, if we were to look at a grasshopper egg right now, and this just tweaked my memory because I was showing pictures of leafhoppers. When you look through the egg membrane, you can actually see their beady little red eyes. Can we do that with grasshoppers? That's right. Gross. What does that mean, Jim? Yeah, right. yeah. You, you Wait, can, you, yeah, you can actually, uh, not quite as visible as, as you might see we got a thick core. But yeah, oftentimes you, you can you can look through that uh, look through that uh, that that egg case and see the developing embryo inside, and uh, uh, see it move along and be quite advanced. So, you guys what has Hollywood taught us about red eyes, though? <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Oh, I said, what has Hollywood taught us about things with red eyes? Evil. With mm -hmm. Halloween coming up, right? Uh, yeah, it's still considered they 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 are native native and ubiquitous. Consider them neutral it's uh it's oh. uh, it's all about context you know there you go okay so mm -hmm. and tonight this is probably going to come up a lot is we'll talk about the pest let's talk about predators and our parasitoids so grasshoppers as you mentioned uh native to the prairie of course several different species um are there any helpers out there that help us with the grasshopper numbers can i take this one absolutely yeah all right last big grasshopper outbreak I was working on echinacea out in the field in my master's degree and those grasshoppers were eating the tape right off my plants. They wouldn't eat echinacea though, which was really cool. And I was actually looking at pollination, so not grasshoppers. They were just getting in my way. But what we were finding were that we had bee flies landing on the echinacea flowers and blister beetles also landing on the echinacea flowers, both of them pollinating, interestingly, but their tie is that their larvae both feed on grasshopper eggs. And so mm -hmm. after a grasshopper outbreak, we get a lot of these bee flies and these blister beetles. Now, when I ran that past Dan Johnson, he said, well, they don't really control populations too well. So what we're hoping for in terms of control are maybe diseases. So I'm going to toss this over to Jim, who's going to tell us about the diseases that happen when things get a little bit more damp in the in the environment well yeah we'll, we'll talk about some of the some of their insect natural enemies and, and flesh that out a little bit more too because i mean I, I, tyler's absolutely absolutely right right i mean bee flies Ooh. and uh and um epicotta blister beetle larvae are yeah, really important it. predators but but i mean uh, field crickets are real important munchers of uh of grasshopper eggs as well and uh, they're also subject to to uh to a number of different fly parasitoids so we've got uh, tachinids, and we've got a number of other muscoid flies that are that are real important. Uh, uh, yeah, some sarcophagid flies, some flesh flies that are real important parasitoids mm -hmm. of these grasshoppers too. So they'll they'll lay eggs on the grasshopper, eggs hatch up, uh, and uh, and uh, and the maggot tunnels their way in. Uh, but I mean, there's there's nematodes that are that are important regulators of grasshopper populations, and uh, I, I feel like we talked about nematomorphs in the past, but maybe maybe we can talk about this briefly. Yes. But uh, if you th think about things like the uh, like the alien movies, but rather than you know a single chest burster, uh, imagine a thirty foot worm exploding out 
the back end of a host. Uh, yeah, there's no other nice way to put that, but that, that's there's functionally what happens with the metamorph. It's 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 a large worm, so I mean it's you know oh pardon me where's my camera there about, we go. about so yeah probably in the three to four inch range and that will wow. explode out, out the out the, the the back end of a grasshopper or other right. large insect. But yeah, to Tyler's point, I mean there there are uh, there are a number of different pathogens that can really significantly uh, influence uh, uh, grasshoppers, and one of the most important ones is uh, is Entomophthora grillii. Yes, and we've I'm actually doing. got different yeah. isolates that have been described for this one, and one will, uh, yeah, some some will uh, some will attack one species of grasshopper. So, two straight grasshopper will be sensitive to one isolate of, of Entomophthora grillii, you know, whereas uh, uh, clear wing won't. And you can actually see them living side by side. You know, all of one species is dying off because they've been exposed. But that fungus really like the, likes the conditions uh, uh, wet. So you get cool, wet years, and uh, and those are typically associated with. Uh, with real big outbreaks of Entomophthora and and, uh, and and subsequent knockdown of those populations, but there there are other fungi as well that really like it really like it moist. Bovaria bassiana is another one, really likes it moist, and um, and a number of uh, protists like Paranosema uh, locuste is uh, is an important regulator of the population. Viruses, bacteria. I mean, they're they're on the menu for a large number but, of years. So, which is amazing and actually pretty amazing when you think of how many species use grasshopper eggs or uh, as food um, and then of course birds eat them all those sorts of wonderful things but mm. it does seem certainly that the grasshopper has adapted to be able to expand its territory and multiply quickly and grow very fast because we did see huge like whole fields just covered in them and a complete yeah. wipeout tyler it sounds like yeah. say something. sir tyler go ahead I was just gonna pick up on what I was doing here. Jim wasn't picking up what I was laying down. So when they're <laughs> what with, are you laying down? When they're infected <laughs> with Entomophthora grilli, oh yeah, climb up to the top of the plant and they hang. Ah, oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, and yeah. they die. and they sit up there, waving in the breeze like this, clutching onto the plant and dropping spores all over their brothers and sisters and cousins and aunts and uncles down on the ground yeah. to infect them. That's so brilliant. Like, that's really quite smart. I've said, is that a virus or is that a? That's a fungus. Or, that's a fungus. It's a fungus that does it. The, zo oh, it the zombie fungus. Yeah. yeah. Humidity drives that, right? So we're hoping for a yeah. wet spring to wipe these grasshoppers out. Yeah. So that so that's interesting yeah. because I've always sort of, uh, and I think there's other people that probably think this, we think of moisture killing grasshoppers because I've heard some people say, oh, it drowns the eggs or it, that sort of stuff. But that's not actually necessarily the, the entire causal mechanism. There's all sorts of things that kill grasshoppers that like moisture. Yeah. You ever seen a grasshopper? Yeah, and the eggs as a, the eggs as a rule are, 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 are pretty resistant to drowning. Uh, yeah. So the the eggs can actually sit suspended in water for for days and and not drown. The nymphs, however, are are really sensitive to drowning. So when you get the first and second instar nymphs, and this actually happened at my place. So we we had, you know I had a major uh, hatching event of two straight grasshopper, and they they were in very large numbers, uh, and uh, got about three inches of rain in two days. Highly localized, and there were dead nymphs everywhere. So uh, yeah, these these drowning events, localized drowning events, can have uh, can have an impact on nymphs. But so the eggs the eggs are a little little more moisture resistant. So okay, dull my rain by the sounds of it. What's that? Yeah, so we, we didn't get too much rain. too much else for the rest of the season. Yeah, so. that that was it, right? Um, yeah. Also, Kevin Kevin says he killed his fair share on the drive home from Egg in Motion. I heard that comment from several people <laughs> that the sound of the insects hitting the windshield as they drove was like deafening. Um, so we, we've all done our part. I'm just, I'm sad to think of what else might've been hit by the windshield, um, or it hitting the car. I don't know which one it goes. Um, all right. So, so we did touch on briefly though, um, that conditions this fall are potentially shaping up similar to last fall, which did mean we had higher or, or more mature embryos. Um, of course, spring conditions are going to play a role in just how bad that gets, but, um, James, are there is like are there counts that are done in the fall for egg numbers to try and get a sense of where we're at? Not for egg numbers. No. What what, what we do? Uh, we we lean on SEIC or Saskatchewan Crop Insurance Corporation, 
uh, to conduct a, a pretty wide reaching survey of grasshopper populations in August and early September. Uh, and the numbers uh, for this year, uh, you know, no surprise to, uh, to the people of Saskatchewan, uh, especially in central and southern region, uh, regions or southwest regions that uh, populations are very high. So it's, you know, it's, it's a product of the warm temperatures and high numbers, you know, a lot of opportunity for boy to meet, boy meets girl, beautiful music plays, those eggs go into the yeah. ground, long period of time for those, for those females to get eggs into the ground. So, I mean, some of, some of these species are quite fecund. I mean, they, they'll, they'll make, you know, in the range of about 400 eggs per female. And that's, that's you know, pretty good fodder for, for, for population increase. So the, the warm, dry conditions, yeah, lots of mating, lots of uh, dense populations to contribute to the next generation, and really good, to, good conditions for both for egg laying and for embryonic development. So I, I have some concerns about the upcoming season or for next season. Okay. Well, Jim, I've got a question for you. What's the last thing that goes through a grasshopper's mind when it hits Kevin's windshield? <laughs> Happy birthday. No, no, no. It's butt. <laughs> I am <know>. caught. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh. But I'm, that's a good one. Okay. okay. Tyler, it's your turn. And I have a long list, everybody. We scribbled down just before I went live, which uh, was thank you both for seeing this through because this has been a challenge with all of us in hotels etc um astro yellows so several yeah. years ago we certainly saw a lot of astro yellows in canola there was so, there were so many questions about what is this and you know why did it happen is it going to happen next year uh mm. what did we see this year and uh yeah and did we did we expect it did we expect it so no one expects the Astro Yellows, um, except me. We've had a project now for the last six or seven years. And every year when I'm writing my reports, I say, it's coming, it's coming. 2012 is coming again. And this is why we're doing the project. So what we've been doing is sampling those migrant leafhoppers. So the Astro Leafhopper is a vector of the Astro Yellows phytoplasma. That means it can transmit it to a plant one plant to another plant. So 2012 was the last big outbreak and we were seeing like $400 million worth of damage just to canola. We had something going on in wheat though too. So dead white heads of wheat. Now, um, dead white heads of wheat could be a lot of things, but uh, I'm thinking it was probably Astro Yellows. I started with Ag Canada a little bit after that, but we had some leafhopper samples. And so when we looked at the migrant generation, we looked at um, what percentage were infected. And so this tells you what your Astro Yellows risk can be. And the percentage infected in 2012 was about 10%. And uh, most years, it's more like less than 1% infection rate. Mm -hmm. So um, here we are, we're monitoring the first arrivals of the leaf operas. What we're finding is that they basically blow in on the May long weekend. So okay. these leaf operas come in on my birthday, basically, which is, you know, just a great gift for me. An excellent gift. It really is. Yeah. yeah. Totally. 2023, last project year that uh, we're being funded for. So I have money to study and do the lab tests. And we've actually been working on a test that takes the diagnostics from one leafhopper. Uh, before we had to test three to five leafhoppers just to get enough DNA using the PCR. And now we've got this test that Tim DeMonso worked out for us and uh, perfected by my grad student, Carolina. Now we can get a, a result out of one leaf hopper in a half an hour, whereas that PCR took about a week before. So the turnaround time is so much better now. So mm -hmm. just fantastic. I actually just presented on the migrations themselves. So I thought it was a pretty cool talk. The uh, people in the room, <laughs> maybe they did too. We'll uh, ask them concurrent sessions. So that brings so me to 2023. So 2020, we had quite a few leaf offers, but of course, COVID had us kind of locked down. So not a whole lot of great data there. But the infection in those couple of years, intervening years was around like 1%, maybe 7%. Then 2023, they showed up on May the 23rd, 2023. And the first few samples that we were able to get through the lab and test were infected at a rate of 16%. Mm -hmm. So this is pretty unheard of. One sample was from our own research farm out of 
dandelion, so this is another reason to hate dandelions, is they can host aster leaf hoppers and they can maybe be a green bridge for the phytoplasma between one year to the other year. And uh, they were infected at 61%. So like, oh, what is going on? And uh, so this is when, you know, we could sound the warning bell, but what do we tell farmers? And we say, okay, like your canola is not even out of the ground yet, but we now have leaf hoppers. Um, mm -hmm. And here's what I, I was leaning on the side of caution, right? We didn't want everybody to just pop on and Panic. spray everything, right? Um, the seed treatments that work against the, the flea beetles work really well against the aster leaf hoppers. And so mm. Estelle, Olivier, Bob Elliott did that work. And yeah, so it actually stops the transmission of aster yellows because it kills the leaf hoppers quickly enough. Really? So I'm banking so on that happening. And okay. in reports, not that much in canola. Yeah, in this year. The seed treatment, though. Hmm, whiteheads and wheat, mm. saw that, no seed treatment. Um, cut flower market in Alberta, devastated. And so okay. this is now a case where there are more, um, if we sound the warning bell, there are definitely more markets that should be worried about aster yellows than just the canola. Then growers. maybe canola. That was a long story. Over to you, that it was, but it was a fantastic story, and it brings up so many <laughs> things. But before we talk about those, and Jason Vote has a question that we're going to tackle as well. Uh, Producer right. Jay, if you could uh, run our first, or sorry, our second read of the night. Our sponsors for the agronomists are Adama Canada, the Pest and Predators podcast, and Enlist E3 from Corteva. Looking for high yields and clean fields? Choose Enlist E3 soybeans, part of the Enlist weed control system. Enlist E3 soybeans help you control tough weeds, providing herbicide choice and tank mix flexibility. Enlist E3 soybeans, the best in beans, period. I say this evening, but I got to tell you, this two hour time difference is messing with me because um, oh. really it's like it's not that late, but in my head and it you, is. And your yeah. throat too. Sorry. Yeah. That. And my throat. Yeah. Anyway, I'll try not to yell. Okay. So two things. So Astro is fascinating stuff. And I guess that does give us some clues as to why it's not an issue year over year, but why it's an issue for some markets. So very cool. Um, Ray DeBenko, I'm going to put my money that uh, romantic music for grasshoppers would be more Carly Simon and Stevie Nicks. I don't know why. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, for sure. Uh, James, but I'll go to you with this question from Jason Vogt, because some of these pests are definitely on our list to talk about tonight. Can insect pests that blow in from the south and typically don't overwinter, diamondback moth, cereal armyworm, green cloverworm, eventually become established and overwinter? at some point and are the ones we should be more worried about than others well that's yeah that's a complicated question i mean a, a lot of the pests that we have and you indicated some of them uh can be major pests diamondback moth uh, is is a major pest in, in you know throughout its range and it occurs in, in in the bulk of north america it doesn't overwinter here though um however with a warming climate there is the potential for it to overwinter here um, however, it's, it's current survival over the, or, over the course of our winters is, is less than 1%. So it's, right. it's going to take a considerably warmer, warmer climate for that animal to overwinter here in any kind of numbers. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, you know, with a warmer climate, there is the, there is the prospect of some, some animals to overwinter here, but for the most part, the animals that we're looking at is migratory pests or those that blow in on storms. So diamondback moth, uh, we had some significant issues with true army worm and cereals this year mm. and that's one that blows up from from southern reaches of uh, of, uh, of north america uh, it doesn't overwinter here though so happily but you know with a warming climate there there is always that possibility um you know uh, p aphid is another one that blows up you know a few of our a few of our pest pest aphid species and uh yeah for the most part they don't overwinter very well here there are some aphids that do over overwinter very well here and they engage in what's called host switching. So they'll actually switch to a, a whole other family of plants other than the, the, than, than the crop pests that they're, that they're attacking. And oftentimes they'll spend the winter feeding on the roots of those plants. And Tyler, if you wanted to talk about uh, uh, pemphigus in, uh, in quinoa, that's probably a good example of that. That's right. So we've been looking at uh, 
this root aphid that popped up in quinoa was also attacking lambs quarters as well and it has a uh, an alternate host where it overwinters and then feeds in the springtime on poplar trees. And uh, we have a few of those in the prairies. One or two. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the, the, the host switching is, is, is a really interesting aspect of, uh, of uh, aphid biology. Uh, the you know, very co complex life cycles uh, yeah, with those animals and very interesting animals. Yeah, definitely. Those aster leafhoppers, they hang around till about the first frost. But, you know, if I put them in the freezer for too long to calm them down, they die. And right. like, they don't deal with the cold very well. There have been, there was one paper that said maybe their eggs can overwinter to a small um, extent. But I haven't really seen a whole lot of evidence of that. Mm -hmm. So host switching, we could call that adaptability, but I'm going to call that, you know, perhaps just rude um, in that it makes it far more difficult to uh, control or to try and keep tabs on them. Now, um, Chris has a great question, which Chris is going to be on the show in a couple weeks. Great question um, related to those leafhoppers uh, that you were mentioning, Tyler. Um, have there been any observations in untreated canola plots with Astra yellow infection being higher? Or is this something that, that should be looked at potentially? That's a great question there, Chris. So do you know of anybody that plants untreated canola besides me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't. You're the only one I know. But so... I did plant untreated canola this year. Um, and I did not actually see much aster yellows in any of those canola plots. Whereas next door in the Camelina, uh, we could probably count 10 to 30, maybe even 60 or 70 affected racemes on the Camelina. And from everything that we've been doing, they don't really like canola. So if they've got options, yeah, they will go into canola. The, the leafhoppers don't do well feeding on it and they don't do well reproducing on it. Yeah. yeah. What, what about mustard? Or do we not know? Or just yeah, mustard is all the same thing. About the same. Yeah. Yeah. And but, it's, I mean, I, go ahead, Tyler. Sorry. I was just going to qualify it with I don't think we know too much about mustard. But maybe. Yeah, maybe. And when, when we say mustard, of course, we're talking about, you know, Brassica nigra and we're talking, you know, yeah. so, you know, brown mustard and oriental mustard. And then there's yellow mustard, which is yeah. a whole other genus uh, yeah. that's very chemically different from 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 the Brassica. So, yeah. So, yeah, it's a, it's a, still lots spicy. of questions. Yep. Keeps you guys busy. That's what it does. It's because it there's does. always more questions to be asked. Okay. Uh, so we did mention there's there's so many more we still have to go through. So let's keep ro let's keep rolling. So Astiel is for sure. Um, James, I'm probably going to say this wrong because I've always called it Hessian fly. But yeah. do you say Hessian? Is that how you say it? Yeah, tomato, I, tomato. Yeah. Okay. I don't actually know. But I do know that this is a fly that's been mentioned before here in Ontario and, and repeat tends to say it's not economic. What about in the West? We have seen um, a bit of an upregulation in our Hessian fly population. So we, we've gone since about 2014, since our last uh, significant reports. Um, and uh, we've seen multiple sites this year uh, with, uh, with Hessian fly pupae showing up. Uh, typically, what's been reported in the past on the Canadian prairies is, is they're really tightly regulated by parasitoids. And there are about four species of parasitoids that really inflict a lot of, a lot of regulatory pressure on these, on these Hessian fly populations. So uh, we ended up with some samples at the crop production uh, or crop protection lab. And uh, Tyler ended up with some samples at uh, AFC Saskatoon. So uh, I reared a, a Eulophid parasitoid. So, so there is a parasitoid in that population uh, that, that these were sampled from. Tyler got another parasitoid. Uh, so there are parasitoids in these populations, but we are seeing an upregulation in the, in the populations of Hessian fly. Um, so just a little bit of background. The reason they're called Hessian fly is the, yes. the thinking was that they came in on the bedding, the straw bedding of Hessian mercenaries as part of the, the in the American Civil, uh, 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 War of Independence. Yeah. Can I just say, I'm just going to state this for the record, that between the names of the parasitoids and things that you gentlemen and your whole group of you that are here get to deal with, as well as how, like their actual, you know, scientific names, as well as the names that they get and why, it's, I'm really jealous. You guys have the coolest jobs ever. And they do ridiculously <laughs> cool things. 
So I'm just putting I'm it out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm not yeah. going to argue with that either. Yeah, um, <laughs> actually, Producer Jay, let's start. Can you put up that, uh, I think it was the, the Coliseum <coughs> or Arena of Death video from, oh, yeah. I want to say, yeah, it was from like Canola Palooza or something like that a little while ago. Now, I, I, I we want to talk about Army Worm. This isn't an Army Worm, I don't think. No, I think it's the other one, Jay, with the big, fat, gross larva having things <laughs> explode out of it. Yeah, that one. Okay, so Tyler, do you know what we're looking at here? Or or did this happen to a pest insect this year quite a bit? It's, oh, that's beautiful. Okay, so it, Jim mentioned the word nematomorph, and then it cued me into the alien movies. Those were called xenomorphs. The xenomorphs burst out through the body wall of humans. These are like xenomorphs, but for insects. Obviously, science fiction borrows heavily from nature. What you're seeing there are the pupae of a parasitic wasp. Sorry, the larvae of a parasitic wasp. The top, where they're all white up there, they're starting to spin their pupae. So they start to pupate as soon as they burst out through that hapless caterpillar's skin. Poor thing. You're, you're making me sad here. Yeah, I'm and not actually dead. sad. So where does something like this happen? In what pest species? So we were talking true armyworm before. Right. The true armyworm blew up here, and they got attacked by, I think it was a Cotesia parasitoid. We're still in the, uh, well, my lab is a little bit slammed with Aster Yellows at the moment. But once we get through that, we'll get back to pet projects like what the heck was crawling out of the true armyworm this year. Uh, last year, though, and in previous years, and it, it looks like the same thing, but um, I am not Jose Fernandez Triana, who's our guy in Ottawa, who can identify these tiny little wasps properly. They all kind of look the same until you get them under the microscope or you look at this little barcoding region on their DNA. And they were coming out of the wheathead armyworm, doing a very similar thing. So the wheathead armyworm or the true armyworm crawls up onto the awns, which is a bit unusual for a caterpillar to do. Who wants to eat awns? But here they are, yeah, awns, awns, boom, outburst these parasitic wasps. And then wow. sometimes the caterpillar just wanders off. And so you don't find the host associated with the parasitoid right. that uh, it was killing it. And so um, we did get the barcoding done on those ones. And the genus was Cotesia. And the species was one that Kevin Float had picked up. And I think his uh, grad student, Vincent, had picked up. Um, it, it looks just like those little wasps, right? So I, I could not identify <laughs> what one of those was, except um, I know that it's Cotesia Vanessa because Vincent Hervé was working on those yeah. from his PhD. So they had colonies of those guys. And so this one we identified to one that had Jose Fernandez Triana's um, initials on it, 08. And that means, yeah, we only found one and we didn't get it identified the species. So we got this so there you go. unnamed Cotesia attacking the armyworms. Okay. So yeah, we, uh, we, we also, yeah, we, we, reared, we reared a lot. Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, no, sorry. I was, I was going to say we, we got some samples into the, uh, uh, crop protection lab as well. And we reared a large number of Cotesia out of, uh, didn't get them to species, but to genus. And, and it's important, it's, it's, it's impor important to have a, an appreciation for the diversity of parasitic wasps. So when we're talking about wasps, so they're all in the same order, ants and bees and wasps. And we're talking about about 125,000 described species with maybe 10 times that uh, in the world. The, the, the problem is that most of them are tiny. Less than, less than a millimeter long, and most of those are parasitic. So the Cotesia are members of that parasitica. And, uh, and so there's a great diversity of them. Most of them haven't been described. And it takes a, it takes a real expert eye or you know, genetic tools to, to be able to, molecular tools, to be able to, uh, to tease out exactly what you're looking at. Uh, but you know, fascinating animals. Super cool. I, and thanks for that, because it does put it in perspective that you know, you get to know the pests, perhaps, of the crops that you're growing, but to try to even start to understand all the other components of what's out there is really, it's, we know the tip of the iceberg completely. Um, and it's a really big yeah. iceberg. So there we go. 
Um, Jason's got a really, really great question here. And I do have a clip um, about trapping that we, we might get to if we have enough time. Um, but so Jason's out of Southern Manitoba. And James, I'll go to you on this one. I mean, realistically, we never get one insect problem at a time. Um, and often there are multiple pests at a different growth stage. So are we any closer to, or is research being dedicated, let's say in canola or other crops, about developing thresholds that take into account other pests? Or are we really still just looking at each pest individually when it comes to thresholds? Yeah, I think there's some generalizations that have that can be made. And I think, you know, if you're talking about cutworms, I mean, they're, they're you know, if you're talking about climbing cutworms or, 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 or subterranean cutworms, then you can make some generalizations in each crop based on that. And, and if you look at, you know, uh, resources like the like the cutworm guide, then, then there are some generalizations made about similar animals with, you know, similar modes of feeding. But typically, yeah, thresholds, I mean, they're, they're, they're really going to be species specific. And, and reason being is, is each of those uh, individual species is going to have different host preferences and some are, are going to be obliged to do host switching and some are going to get through the development more quickly. And there are a number of different factors that need to be considered with each species. But when, you know, when we talk about major pest species, yeah, that's where the, you know, the actual experimental data threshold work goes in. We, we have a number of nominal thresholds, of course, which are, you know, functionally best guesses. You know, educated guesses certainly, but but functionally best guesses. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, no, there's constant work going on with uh, with thresholds. I mean, uh, Sean Sean Prager's lab is currently working on Ligus thresholds in Faba, uh, and making some progress on that. Tyler, if you want to comment, I'm, I'm imagining on on peas. Peas, no. good. I want to talk about peas. Imagine wrong, actually. Um, so I know Jason's asked oh. this question before, and a lot of people have asked this question before. So first of all, that kind of research is really difficult because you have to have lightning strike in three different places or two different places. Mm -hmm. You need to have multiple sites with these outbreaks. And so I know in the past entomologists have been uh, much more nimble in the field. So, okay, we've got multiple pest species in the Northwest, let's say, let's go up there and pick a bunch of fields. We have a lot more trouble these days getting into those fields, but I'm going to say, um, is there any research being dedicated to it every year? I plant canola in the hopes that we're going to get the perfect storm of a lot of things in there. And last two years, yes. So we've had crucifer flea beetles munching on that late stage canola. I've had diamondback moth in there in 2021 and also, sorry, 2022, 2023 and ligus bugs. And so I was planting canola mm -hmm. for a project with Hector Carcamo trying to revisit those ligus bug thresholds. And Hector has a, a picture of me in his presentation doing this because <laughs> we didn't get any ligus bugs. As soon as we got funding, the ligus bugs disappeared. But I kept on planting those canola fields in the hopes that they'd show up. Sure enough, the year after the funding ended, ligus yeah. bugs showed up and we had three different insect pests in there. So I bought insecticide that kills flea beetles while well, kills everything. I bought insecticide that would mm -hmm. just kill ligus bugs. I bought insecticide that would just kill diamondback moth, time two actually. And so, yeah, is someone doing that research? I'm trying, but it's gonna be, you know, a kind of a long, heavy slog. I have, I did it again this year and you know how it rained in Saskatoon here for like three straight days, heavy, hard, kept me out of the field. We couldn't combine that. And my farm manager said, yeah, yeah, about 60% of your field is shelled out, even though I used a, I used a shatter resistant variety of canola. So my yields are not going to be amazing. And Hector said to me too, in 2021, when I handed him some Ligus data, he said, oh, I can't use this. Your yields are too low. And he said, it was 2021. There was no <laughs> rain. Those were bumper years. crops. Yeah. yeah. Everything's yeah. relative, Hector. Everything's relative. relative, exactly. But if, yeah. yeah, go ahead, James. But but there are there are some other, there are a number of projects always ongoing looking at thresholds. Um, and I mean, we're working under the uh, strategic field program, uh, looking at lagus thresholds in flax, 
Uh, we had a major uh, lagus here in flax a couple of years ago. Uh, of course, now that, you know, one of those things where, you know, you get some money to work on something and it's difficult to come across enough insects to do significant damage, but we're hoping to get enough information to lead towards that. Uh, and also under SFP, you know, in collaboration with, uh, with uh, Tyler and Sean, um, working towards PAFID uh, thresholds in, in some different pulse crops as well. But I mean, there are a number of different entomologists working on working on these uh, working on these problems too. So, so you did mention peas there, Jim, and uh, ligus bugs. Peas. Yeah. So I'm gonna yeah. go. I'm gonna throw it out there to fava beans. So ligus bugs do big damage to fava beans, right? Big feeding scars on these, you know, bright white seeds. So mm, in the project that both Jim and I were working on, we we're looking at spray thresholds, spray timing for P aphids, but we also had a ligus here. So I'm also counting ligus in there. And we're gonna look and see whether or not the beans that we took off were maybe less damaged. Um, and cause we can do that with uh, yeah. one bind that we've got. So um, yeah, so that is maybe a potential where we could look at um, the effects of, you know, P aphids plus ligus in fava bean and lentil and maybe even pea because I had all three of those on the go. Nice. Now, I'm just going to pause quickly. I'm going to tell Jason, maybe just plant less canola, because canola seems to be the favorite for all the insects. I know, that's not realistic. I'm kidding. Okay, we're going to go to our last uh, sponsor read for the night, and then uh, I do want to talk a little bit more about P. aphid uh, right after this. Our sponsors are Adama Canada, Enlist D3 from Corteva, and the Pest and Predators podcast. This podcast series is where top entomologists highlight the insect field heroes hard at work for Canadian farmers. Hosted by Real Agriculture Sean Haney and brought to you by Field Heroes, powered by the Western Grains Research Foundation, Pest and Predators is an in-depth look at the many insects who share our fields. Find out more at Real Agriculture, download the podcast, or visit fieldheroes.ca. Nope. There we go. Tyler's on the phone. This is fantastic. I love this. Tyler has business to do, guys. Okay. Yeah, it was business, actually. Yep. It, it, I believe it was. I completely Sorry. believe it. Okay. I'm going to apologize. I just hung up on her. Oh, it, uh, make sure you apologize later. Don't know who it is, but tell them we're very sorry. We're almost done. And I do thank you for taking your hour out of your conference to do this. All right. So we did talk about P. aphid. We talked about Ligus. Um, what about pea leaf weevil, actually? Uh, James, do we have uh, do we have an update on pea leaf weevil? Is it moving and expanding its territory? Yeah, we, we had, uh, um, before I just uh, jump jump to the chase, uh, we've been monitoring this animal for some time. It is, it is invasive uh, and it's, uh, it, it does continue to move east and it does continue to move north. And we had a couple of pretty cool years. So about three years with very little pea leaf weevil activity, we saw them really come roaring back last year, particularly uh, in the Northeast. Um, I, have an, I have an inkling that, uh, that their populations are, uh, are influenced by snow cover. Um, and, and I've done a little bit of modeling to indicate that. There are some different ideas. So uh, there, there, you know, there's, there's one school of thought that's uh, uh, um, uh, uh, suggests that it may be uh, due to moisture. Um, we will see how the models pan out, uh, but um, we do continue to monitor that animal, and this year's survey indicates big numbers. Uh, so another ra uh, large increase of pea leaf weevil uh, numbers uh, throughout the east of the province. Uh, real heavy numbers in the northeast, and uh, and a real upregulation of those populations in the northwest as well. So growers uh, in those regions, we will be uh, publishing uh, that map. Uh, uh, on our ministry website and the Prairie Pest Monitoring Network uh, website as well. Uh, but growers in those areas should consider a thymethoxam C treatment, a neonic C treatment. Uh, that is by far the most effective uh, treatment for, uh, for pea leaf weevil. Um, the data on controlling adults with foliar sprays is not very conclusive. Uh, and uh, the females are long lived, quite fecund, make a lot of eggs. Uh, and those, uh, but the larvae are, are, are the damaging bits or the damaging portion of their life cycle. And the seed treatments do a good job, a good job of limiting their, their damage. So, mm -hmm. that I, numbers are right. The weevils, these are the ones, the larvae are the ones, they notch the leaves, right? They 
Correct. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I'm envisioning <coughs> a little. T -t 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 anyway, uh, nobody needs my yeah, hand yeah. pocket. No, the, the, yeah. the feeding, uh, they, they're in a genus called Cytona, and they're, they're, they're one of about of, of five species of Cytona that will munch on legumes, but they're, uh, they're uh, really damaging to peas and faba because those are true hosts. Of, of those animals, there are a lot of cytona that will that will, or there are multiple cytona species that will do that notch feeding. But pea leaf weevil will actually complete its development on peas and faba, and that's really that's really what causes the economic damage. Mm -hmm. Now, Tyler, you mentioned uh, flea beetles, crucifer flea beetles. Mm -hmm. I know uh, in Alberta, anyway, we were and Manitoba. And Jason, I know you're in the chat, or I hope you still are. Um, not sure how the year turned out. But I think most of us were pretty darn afraid of what flea beetles were going to look like in 2023. And for many areas, we're hearing reports, cutworm ended up being the bigger pest. Um, so for your area, Tyler, or for, from what you heard, what were the biggest uh, flea beetle issues this year? And were they in certain areas? Was it crucifer versus striped? What are we thinking? All right. Well, I'm going to qualify it with, we got some money to study the striped flea beetles specifically. And uh, that project started in 2021. So guess what happened? Striped flea beetle kind of disappeared in our region. Um, mm -hmm. We'll see them oh, in the wait. spring. Uh, so the, the idea behind that project is what the heck are they doing in the fall? And uh, still don't really know. So they might be going to bed earlier, um, but we don't really think that they're, they're not feeding in the crops. Like crucifer will stick around. We collect scads, those are the sweep nets in your canola field in august and early sort of late july but yeah these striped flea beetles uh they don't like it dry and 2021 was quite dry and so we think they just kind of died on the roots in their larval form and so if we have less problems this year it might be because of that knockdown in the population there mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there was there was some speculation that uh, there there's a new product uh, with a group four D insecticide, and there was some speculation that wide use of this product might have had a negative impact on flea beetles. I, I'm I'm suspicious about about that conclusion. Uh, I, I think um, the use that would be required uh, didn't match what we saw with the populations, but we we didn't see a lot of terribly damaging flea beetle populations this year. We did see some in the Northeast, uh, and those were primarily straight flea beetle. Um, but uh, for the bulk of the province uh, was, not a, was not a terribly scary year with uh, as far yeah. as flea beetles go. I even, you know, went ahead and planted untreated canola again. And last year, 2022, I lost three fields of untreated canola. When I say untreated, I mean, they've got a fungicide, they don't have the insecticide. And so I planted plots of untreated ones and yeah, they got hammered pretty hard, but I still had plants. Whereas, yeah. you know, the year before, no plants. There was nothing. Yeah. And uh, Jason does relate that he did, uh, there was less spring for flea beetles for him as well. We def definitely heard that in Alberta. Uh, Doug Moisey, I think just on the show a few weeks ago, said that everybody was super worried about it and it just, um, yeah, it just didn't necessarily come about, which... If it is a dryness issue, that definitely would fall in line with where we're at with a lot of parts of the prairies year over year. So definitely could be a factor. Um, Jason says that uh, in South Central Manitoba, probably would have had more crucifer versus striped in the end. So um, I didn't know, Tyler, that it worked this way, that if you get funding for a particular insect, it goes away. Yeah. So if... Well, so maybe... Yeah, most of the time. So, James, if you could uh, get funding for a particular project and make one insect go away, which one would it be? Two straight grasshopper. Ah, yeah, that's a good that, one. that that would take that would take uh, uh, hiring a grad student. There you go. Okay, that's, that's a surefire way to get rid of an insect. Yeah. There you and go. And this goes right back to Jason's question, right? Well, is there any yeah. research going on? Right, research has to get funded. Research gets yep. funded when we have outbreaks. It takes yeah. us time to write things up. Um, then it takes a whole lot of process to get the money. So projects are not nearly as nimble as they might yeah. be. And so, right, so two years later, okay, now I've got the funding to study this and boom, the insect is gone, so. Yeah, or you've got yeah, the funding. I mean, to, Tyler, to Tyler's point, these, 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 
No, oh, sorry, ahead. to Tyler's point, these I think these these, these populations are are ephemeral. They you know they 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 they, they, they cycle up, they cycle down. Uh, I mean, they're they're subject to to different factors that regulate them. You know, outside of you know getting funding or graduate outside students. funding. Oh, well, that's an interesting theory to test. Yeah, that's yeah, test that one. <laughs> so, but but at the same time, exactly that, James. It's you know, there's these issues are ones that perhaps are driven by our you know weather cycle. And so, if you're at the tail end of a wet cycle, you've got the results of that wet cycle that you're dealing with. And then, if you know you're well into the dry cycle, you're dealing with the results of that. So, I do. I mean, I think it's a it's an excellent point that we need research that. Or research can only be so nimble because, of course, when you get a research project, it also needs to be two or four years to really get good data to do something with it. So, yeah, like my Astro yeah. Yellows project, I had to get it extended by an extra three years, and sure enough, then we we hit one of those. And you captured it, yeah. Time, right. So our little short three-year periods can kind of miss those windows of insect outbreaks. Yeah, yeah. We saw that Lagus and Hector's project. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that was a really good point. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, all right, I I really appreciate this, and I appreciate everyone putting up with my terrible voice. It hurts a lot, guys. I gotta tell you, um, but I'm glad. <laughs> yeah, I feel better. Yeah, thanks. I am glad that I'm in my own hotel room and uh, not subjecting anybody to this uh, for the next little while. Anyway, and I do really appreciate both of you for taking time out of your conference. Um, so neat uh, for everyone watching. Tyler and James are actually just a room or two apart from each other. We had tried to do this all in the same room, but it wasn't going to work. So um, I do appreciate it. And it's a lot of fun to be able to do this. What's that, Tyler? You didn't want to hang out with us. I understand. And, right. Yeah. That's exactly it. Um, and they will be going out after this if anybody wants to go meet them. Um, all right. We'll leave it there. Uh, Tyler, Ooh. James, thank you so much and enjoy your conference. All right. Thanks very much for having yeah. us. My appreciate pleasure. It. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Yeah. All right. And thanks to our show sponsors, of course, the Pest and Predators podcast and List E3 and to Adam of Canada. I will be back uh, next week. Actually, next week, we're also going to have a bit of a Saskatchewan event. We're going to be talking about spot spraying and uh, the economics of spot spraying. Is it really saving money? Uh, so Tom Wolf will join us for that. Uh, don't, uh, don't miss that one. It's going to be a good one. 8 p.m. Eastern next week, uh, right here on The Agronomists. Thanks, everyone, for watching and putting up with this. Uh, thanks, Producer Jay, and to our guests. Cheers, everybody.